covered now with lines and creases, tickets torn in hand, memories in bits and pieces. Welcome to the West End Video Newsletter. My name is Joe Lopiccolo, your host for this week's newsletter. Today we have two special guests, uh, former West Enders, Mr. Keith Ross. Hi, Keith. Welcome to the show today. Welcome. And the gracious Anna K. Stevenson Grant. Hi. Hi, Anna. Hi. How are you How doing? How are you doing? Fine, fine. Welcome to the show. Glad to have you here today. And uh, the West End, Anna and, and uh, Keith was known as a melting pot of uh, all colors and nationalities. It was known as an urban village. And uh, a good, good, good part of the history of the West End uh, before, in the 1800s, was, the West End was all black originally. Then it went to Irish and Jewish and Italian. And then it became a melting pot of all nationalities. And uh, part of the uh, culture that we haven't heard a lot about is the black culture in the West End, which you were a great part of. And uh, tell me, Anna, what was it like growing up in the West End? I don't know. I came to Boston when I was seven years old. We came from Virginia. Mm -hmm. And from day one, you know, um, I got lost the first day, and everybody rounded up, brought me back to my uncle's house. And it's always like in the West End. You know, if, a, if someone steps out from somewhere else, everybody knows that you weren't there. They knew you didn't belong there. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like I had a lot of fathers. I had Italian fathers, I had Jewish fathers, I had Polish fathers. And they, they, they were my fathers. If they said to me, I want you off this corner in 10 minutes, I knew that I had to go home in 10 minutes and not say to my mother that Mr. Mr. Wilkowski said, get off that corner. I knew I had to be home. Mm -hmm. And I knew he told me because he cared about Anna Kay. Um, I, we had that kind of thing like, you know, you. They knew I was supposed to be home when the street light come on. Everybody be in the window. You on your way, Anna? You know, get down there. And as I go, someone else, else told me where I had to be. But then, you know, like, I, 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 you know, we was poor. But I never realized how poor I was until I moved out of the West End. You know, if you're broke now, you have to go to somebody. If you were broke on the West End, everybody was coming to you. Uh, if I, if I, my husband was out of work and Anna Pork and Nikki would say, Dave didn't go to work yet? And I said, no, send the kids up. But Anna Samaria said, oh, you sent them up to her house, huh? <coughs> oh, what's wrong with my house? But it was just that love. You, you, you know, you could just feel it. It wasn't like, I never appreciated the West End until I moved out. Mm -hmm. um, you had so much, but we really didn't have anything. We, I wish that my children were, could grow up. I could turn back the hands of times and be where I was. Mm -hmm. You know, um, just everything was like the like the movies. Um, you know, we had we had fights. I had big family fights. <laughs> you know, I'm not talking to her no more. But you went down the park, you put your hands up, you fought, and it was all over with. Exactly. You know, um, you came home. You, their mother would call you up, says, come up, says, and eat. Get your face washed. Your mother won't be home in another hour. It wasn't like, I don't want you to talk to that kid because uh, this one's over there is doing that. It was never like that. We were a family. The police was our family. I'm not Catholic. Father Fa Powers would come to my house. He'd see that if he knew my house was out of work, I'd come out Monday morning. There'd be a basket in front of my door. The rabbi would come over there the next day, and there would be something else in front of my door. We had a unique family, you know, it's good. Keith lived three doors down from me. I can tell you everybody lived in each apartment. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm black, I know I'm black. I was never so aware that I was black until I moved in a black neighborhood. And I heard words that I never heard there. In the West End, that's right. You know, I, and I was amazed and I'd come home and I would be crying. She says, are you crazy? Mama says, are you crazy? And I was a grown woman. I couldn't deal with that. I hear people say they have problems with, I mean, that's on them. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a problem, let it be yours. Exactly. But I wasn't brought up like that. I like, I like where I lived. If I could, like I said, if I could turn it back, anybody I meet from the West End, we just can't walk away from each other. We got a hug, we got a touch, we got to ask about whoever's there. 
and you spend all that time. You know, life is good. I, I'm glad I grew up there. I, I, I don't regret a minute, even the hardship, the pain, everything. I had the best. I, uh, I talked to Phil Donahue, and he was angry with me. And he, 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 uh, he told me there was no such place. It didn't exist. And I told him I could call anybody right now, the friends I've been with for 30, 40 years, and I would get the same hug, the same love. And if they had to cuss me out, they'd do that too. How did this happen? How did this? He was on TV, and mm -hmm. he was talking about and the, the myth of the West End. Oh. You know, it yeah. was a mythical thing. And it hurt me to my heart. And I didn't think I could get to him, but I got on the phone. So you called, huh? Yeah, I called. I was angry because he, he was never there, and so he didn't know. Exactly. You know, had he been there, He'd be ranting and raving just like I am, and I'm proud to be a West Ender. I wouldn't want to live any place else. I am too. <laughs> you know? Right. And I, when I brought my daughter, I had told my daughter about the West End. She listened. She said to me, no, I, don't want, I really don't want to go. I said, oh, come on. You meet my friends. She says, mine. She, but when she got there, and she started meeting everybody, and she met Philip Odo. You know Philip. <laughs> and he just carried on, and she came back. She says, Mommy knows real people. Real people. She says, you, you should, everywhere mommy went, mommy got a hug. Everybody knows mommy. But everybody knows everybody from the West End. It isn't like you live over there and you're so-and-so and you live down there and you're so-and-so. Even when you're broke. I remember I didn't have enough money to get a whole loaf of bread and go get three slices of bread. And they find out that's all you had. Get out of here, take the bread and go home. Where can you do that now? No place. Sit on your doorstep all night long. Please come by, see if you're all right, and go on. And we had police friends. Mm -hmm. We had police friends. I live where I live now, you got to lock your lock. If you give somebody a nickel, they beat you out of a quarter. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's just hard, but I'm not going to change because that's about me. And I would blow my whole heritage. <coughs> and I wasn't born in West End. I wasn't born in Massachusetts. That's the only home I recognize, and that's the only home I want. Now, Keith lived there, and we worked. And we were hard-working kids, bringing home money, go down to Haymarket Square at 4 o'clock in the morning, tear boxes and bring home and put in a cold wood stove. Mm -hmm. You made some money, you take your little money and throw it on the table, let your mother pick out what you want. You ask your kids for a nickel now. <laughs> you ask them to pay part of the rent. They have seizures on you. In the West End, you didn't have to do that. It was all part of the everyday living. It was a sense of pride. You exactly. wanted to do that. Right. Hey, I gave my mother $5 this week. Mm. But it's... I think we lost a lot. I think we lost a lot. I think they took, they took every, they took our heart. They sure did. You know, and I'm not ashamed to say I cry big times. I, I get dramatic. I, I, I work myself into a stage that people want to get away from me. If you say Western Weir, you know somebody over there? I want to go. I mm -hmm. want to be there. Mm -hmm. Because I know that when I can be around them people, I can be Anna Kay. I don't have to be I don't have to be something for somebody out there. Mm -hmm. I can be me. I can, I can be me. You know how it is to be with somebody that you really love and you know they love you, and then be around somebody you know they're gaming on you, they're telling you a story that they want you to hear? That's a hard thing to be. Mm -hmm. I have to have 40 faces for somebody else out there. But when I get around the West End, I can take off my shoe. I can lay anyway. I know I, I, I can go Sue Diggitano's house. She up on the door. You know what is up this? It's Anna Kay's room. <laughs> okay? That's, that's today. Right now, I can and go And the right West End's there. gone 30 years ago, and you still have this I experience. I can go to her house right now. This is Anna Kay's room. Imagine that. Okay? Right. Do you know what a beautiful feeling that you, you, you fall out in the street out there. They'll step over you twice, mm -hmm. and then they may come back, or they see the shoe fit them. Fit that's bad. Mm -hmm. But in the West End, if you got drunk, I take you home. I'll bring you up your house. I'll call your wife. Hey, he's up here. Come and get him. I'll let him sleep. I'll pick him up in the morning. You do that now. You take some lady's husband home to your house. And if you can live or get out the hospital afterwards, you're in bad trouble. You're in serious trouble. There's no trust. There's no love. Where does it go? Where do you, <coughs> I'm not saying everybody's like that, but where are the people that are? Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I would trade, if they told me right now, Anna Kay, you want to make, I'd pack my other dress? Nah, I'd leave the dress. Because once I got there, somebody would give me a dress. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wouldn't even deal with that. I came here because, you know why I came here? When you said, I wouldn't care what you said. You was eating slop today. You said <laughs> everybody was coming here to the West End. I want to be there. This is one day I can be Anna Kay. Mm -hmm. It takes so much out of me being somebody else. I don't want to be. 
Exactly. It does. But you know, and God's good to me. He's truly good to me. You know why? I got crazy kids just like me. <laughs> you know? Because I give them what I got. Mm -hmm. And I stress on them. I, I bring them to my friend's house. Because I want my kids to have the kind of life that I had. Mm -hmm. You know? People want to get together on 4th of July. Every day was 4th of July with us. In the West End, right. Every, every day. You moved. You look at now. You clean your hallway. You've you got to wait and see if the people are going to throw any more trash or not. Mm -hmm. The West End, you had curtains up in your hallway. Mm -hmm. You swept in front of your door. I mean, you took a sense of pride. There were old antique buildings. But I bet you can go in any home in there and eat off the floor. You know, that's the kind of love. I know the Parkers had 23 kids. Mm -hmm. And they had three floors, which you can go in every floor. Mr. Digitano, he had two floors. One for the girls, one for the boys. And there was 14 of them. But you could go in, and you come in their house, even if they have one loaf of bread. <coughs> Here, Anna, get your yeah, piece. Everybody shared. Get your piece. Mm -hmm. And if he see me at supper time, you know, he, come up here. Get up here and eat. <laughs> They cared enough about you. Mm -hmm. they, they wanted you to be happy. You know, people don't care anymore. They don't care about how you feel if you're mm -hmm. sick. I got these burns here. I thought I was in Hollywood. People calling on the phone. They was at my door. People I had seen in 20 years. People from the West End that read about you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know, you know, I wanted to lay there and stay sick so they could keep coming, mm -hmm. you know? Uh -huh. When I tell people they want, my kids tell me, Mom, you're like a broken record. All I want to talk about. You keep me here for 100 years, I tell you 100 years. This show couldn't last me long enough. Okay, and okay I, I have three children myself, and I, I have the same feelings as you do about the West End. I grew up in the West End. My kids tell me the same thing. They don't really understand what it was like in those days. Really, really. Keith, uh, tell us something. Did you have the same experiences as Anna Kay? I sure have. Tell us about but my experience, I was born in the West End. I was born at 5 Parkman Street. And I uh, did just about the same thing she done. But yet, I had a lot of experience. I used to hang out with this girl. We used to hang in the William Blackstone School we graduated at. But I was the only uh, colored, oh, I mean, uh, <laughs> excuse me, I mean, where you? Oh, black there. And we was all white kids. We all got together. But I always used to use the word instead of black, I used the word colored. We never heard of this mm -hmm. kind of deal before until recently. Mm -hmm. We used to play, we used to have fun, we used to sk skate, roll bikes, and a, lot, a few of my boys would come and say, well, what do you say, Keith, let's go get something to eat. I said, why don't you come up my house? No, no, we go up there. We leave the Blackstone School, we go, we go down there, uh, like that was, uh, 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 North Russell Street. We walked down North Russell Street. One of the boys, but mother, would call, Keith, Jimmy, John, up the house. You know, you know what, John Smiley? Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. And we have to go up the house and eat. She wouldn't just let us stay there. I have to go up there. I have to call my mother and say, "Mother, all right, stay there, enjoy yourself." We come out of there. The girls on uh, Hill Street. We go with the girls on Hill Street. We're going up the library. Mostly, we we deal at the library a lot. We mostly. I went to the library a lot, read and stuff like that, get the education. We never knew all this stuff that was going on until recently. Mm -hmm. Like when I, when I graduated from William Blackstone School, instead of me staying there, I decided to go into service because I wasn't making nothing and I was blamed for something which I didn't do. Mm -hmm. My father, you know, accused me of it, so I had to deal with it. So I just went into service, came home. We had 15 in the family. 15? 15. 15 children. And did you, did you live in, the, in one, one, one house? I lived at 35 Spring Street all my life. Uh -huh. And I had a good time. And did you take up the whole house? The whole yeah. No. Different just, floors uh, or just one apartment? We had uh, 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 what, 10 rooms on the, on the top floor. Oh, imagine that. And uh, the uh, man that owned the place was uh, Brightman Meat Market. Mm -hmm. I worked with him downstairs. He would give me meat. Take upstairs, mm -hmm. eat. All the kids had a good time. They ate and everything. We had wooden coal stoves. I remember the winter time, it was so cold, I had to go way up there and get a bag of coal, a hundred pound bag and carry it out. That was nothing. And the wood, we used to break the wood up like that, put it in the stove, something to keep warm. 
and still had to go to school. Okay. Did you ever go down to the railroad tracks to, to, <laughs> to get the coal from the old, from the old sure tracks? I sure did. Bring them back? Yep. That was down by North Station. Right, right. I had to pick it up, throw it in a bag, and run home to and warm the fire and stuff like that. Oh, great. Okay. And also... Ice in the summer. They ice in the summer, right, right. <laughs> oh, yeah, the ice house, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, the ice from the trains, mm -hmm. the ice from the trains. Okay. Hope the track, hoping that one of those tra um, crates break so you get the yeah. food, and then the guys would give you the food if they broke off of there, you know, oh, it's good. Okay, we're going to stop for a minute. We're going to break away from, uh, uh, we're going to go to a tape that was filmed at the uh, Afro-American History Museum up in Beacon Hill, which mm -hmm. is still part of the West End. And our narrator is going to be the curator of the museum. <coughs> we'll take away for a while, and we'll be back shortly. Hello. My name is Maurice Nobles, Jr. I'm the site manager of this building, uh, the African Meeting House, as it was built in 1806. Uh, this building would be in the center of this first established black community located on the north slope of Beacon Hill. Um, the church initially would be called the First African Baptist Church, and for over 90 years, this building would provide that first established black community here with not only their spiritual, uh, but their educational, political, and social needs. Um, the church, uh, for instance, in the year of 188, whereas there were no schools uh, in Boston that would allow for the accessibility of black children, uh, this church in 188, the basement of it, would be used um, uh, to educate all of the black children in Boston under one roof. Um, this church also would be given the nickname of the abolitionist church in the Black Faneuil Hall because it would allow all of the politicians, the Frederick Douglasses, the William Lloyd Garrisons, the, the, the Harriet Tubmans, the Charles Sumners, and the John Browns, it would allow these abolitionists, black, white, male, and female, to come in and speak from its podium out on those issues of freedom and justice. As a matter of fact, the African Meeting House also uh, would be used by Frederick Douglass as a recruiting station as they would recruit the first black troops allowed to fight in the Civil War. They would call themselves the 54th Regiment. William Lloyd Garrison also, as you can see here, possibly behind me, would also be uh, not only allowed to speak from the podium, but he also, in the basement, would be, uh, use that space uh, to create or uh, to establish a new organization calling themselves the Anti-Slavery Society, the New England chapter. Um, Mariah Stewart even would give her farewell speech from the basement of the church. The building today is basically used as it was in the 1800s, the, as it is today owned by the Museum of Afro-American History, and whereas it is the principal and chief artifact of the museum, we basically try to meet those same needs of our surrounding communities as our sister church would, as our forefathers would use it in the early years. Uh, we still try to hold some spiritual services here. We still uh, meet, try to meet some of the educational needs of our communities. Um, we hold tours, for instance, every day, uh, Monday through Friday, 9 to 4, 10 to 4, whereas we have school groups of children coming from all over the country into the African Meeting House to learn of this positive side of history, um, giving them a different perspective of the African American um, in his history. Um, the, tr the building also is used uh, for political rallies. People come in often to discuss uh, concerns of our communities. And this still remains the social center, whereas we not only have um, gospel concerts, but we have chamber music concerts in the African Meeting House. So we still today are trying to meet those same basic needs. Um, the African Meeting House has also served as a Jewish synagogue at the turn of the century, beginning in the years of 1898 from 1972, as the Lubavitch would come from, the, from Europe. They also would utilize this building um, as their synagogue. It would be called the Lubavitch Synagogue. And in the year of 1972, as they would begin relocating into uh, Brookline upon completion of their new synagogue, they would give uh, the Museum of Afro-American History the first option to repurchase the church, um, sort of like giving it back to the black community. And we did. And so today, the Museum of Afro-American History is the proud owner of the oldest standing black church in the nation, um, the African Meeting House. And so we welcome you into uh, 
our our building today, should we say our, meaning everyone, we're being inclusive as we say this. Um, we hope that as you view this tape, um, this segment, that we also hope that you will be able to come in um, because it is still here as it has been reopened since 1987. Um, that would be uh, the year in October of that year uh, when we would reopen the building back to the community. And so we hope that you will use this as an opportunity, an informational piece, to come back uh, to the north slope of Beacon Hill and see the restored African meeting house or come back and see the, the, the building that would house the Lubavitch as they would come here um, in the mid-1800s. Um, come and revisit those who would reshape um, Boston and those that would reshape America in many ways. Um, as William Lloyd Garrison said um, on January 6, 1832, we have met tonight uh, in this obscure schoolhouse. It says our numbers are few and our influence limited. Uh, but mark my prediction, Faneuil Hall, shall air long echo with the principles we have set forth. We shall shake the nation by their mighty power. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, we're back live now, and we'll continue our discussion on the black perspective perspective about growing up in the West End. And okay, uh, did you, what schools did you go to in the West End? Do you recall in the schools? Mayu, Walter Winchell, William Blackstone, Peter Faneuil. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think it's both it. And how, how was the schooling there? Was it? It was strict, it was good. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason why I know it's good because I've been out of school for 1,000 years already, but I went back to go to college. Did you and, really? And um, I thought I'd forgotten things and and they start coming back different things from different teachers had taught me and it start coming back um, like I watch my grandchildren go to school now and they're getting out of school at 19 18 20 when we were kids we got out 16 you know um, I wonder why it has switched up like that because things my grandchildren are learning now I learned in the seventh grade they learn in like in the ninth and tenth mm -hmm. it's almost like they went backwards I can outspell my grandchildren. Uh, and I'm not saying it because of that, but they can't spell words that they should be able to spell in the seventh or eighth grade. They're spelling words at fifth grade level. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if these kids have lost something. I'm, um, that I think at that time the teachers demanded more from you, and you didn't have that hub hub in, you know, outside of school and stuff. You, know, you went to school and it was business. Mm -hmm. As usual, you know, you did not come in there and smoking cigarettes and razzmatazz, and they would bring your parents, and if mm -hmm. your parents had to stay out of work too late for you, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, don't let, and and don't let your parents hear that you was rude in school. You know, that was, my mother wouldn't accept nothing, a C in conduct, a C in effort. I'd been in there, I'd be collecting old age pension now, because mm. she didn't, she said. She told me the dumbest child in the whole world can get A in conduct and A in effort. That means you're trying, mm -hmm. and that means you're behaving. And the school system here, it seems like um, they're so sophisticated now, they've lost something. Exactly. They lost, um, they lost the, the closeness and the... But my grandson got a beautiful teacher, and he, he's compassionate. He calls. Mr. Thomas, um, <coughs> he calls constantly. He's really interested. He tells me books to get outside of the school to get. I, I would like to see another teacher do that. You That's know? what we had on the West End. The teachers care. They call. They knew your parents. Uh, True officer would come. Yeah. I, remember, I remember me and Fat Chandler fooled around so late we couldn't get in school. And we knew we didn't have a note, so we hid. We went in the house. We were real smart. We left the door open. The tune officer came, woke us up, and took us back to school. Now, you don't see truant officers. You don't see that. But we were real smart. We left the door open. We went back to bed, and he brought us back to school. Now, then we were in deep trouble. And, uh, and the truant officer knew everybody. Exactly. And you couldn't go to no one's house if you was out of school. It's a different aspect now, you know. Tell us the watermelon story. You had a, a very interesting <laughs> the watermelon story. Key Sister Edie and I stole a watermelon <laughs> from Snippers on Spring Street. And Snippers we, was a little grocery store. Yeah, uh, you know how big he was. He weighed there. about 500 pounds. And we trudged this watermelon home. We hid it. We got it in between the double doors. And we were eating. My mother saw it. She let us eat it. 
and then she walked us back to the store. This is a Saturday, busy, wall-to-wall -wall people there. And my mother, I, she said, I want you to go in there and tell this man you're a thief. I say, what? Tell him you're a thief and you're going to pay for it. I begged all the way up the street, please, Ma, if you ever love me, Edie's right behind. Come on, Edie, you're going too. She said, and we had to go up there and tell this man in front of all these. I said, I'm a thief. She said, no, tell it loud so everybody can hear you. I said, Mommy, please. I had to say, I'm a thief, and I stole this watermelon. And Snipper said, every day I pass by, there's the thief that stole <laughs> the watermelon. Well, today don't get that, boy. And my mother made me pay for it, mm -hmm. and I had to work for him for a whole month every weekend after school. Mm -hmm. And I, you can rest assured, you didn't have to worry about this person here. You just didn't steal. You just didn't steal. Who was you going to steal from? Everybody knew you. Right, exactly. You know? And then you didn't have that. And if I've seen the times when Soupy the cop would catch somebody doing something. If he gave you a spanking, you were scared to go home and tell your mother you got one. It, it went like Father Powers who didn't have no, he didn't hesitate. He would give you a spanking too. You know? Uh, <laughs> I turned to 18 years old, I went to North Station, and I thought I was going to see this X-rated movie called Duel in the Sun with Jennifer Jones. And he told me, he said, Stevenson, you're not going in there. I said, I'm going in to see this movie. He said, Stevenson, you're not going in there. So I got a little bold, and I figured, I'm 18 years old, he's not going to do nothing to me now. I said, Father Powell, first of all, I'm 18. Second of all, I'm not Catholic. And then third, I'm going to see the movie. He says, what? Go ahead if you want. So I got to the counter and people were looking. And just as I got to the counter, I seen him taking off his belt. I said, nah, this will never work. But see, then he was compassionate. When I had the fire and I lost my children, he was the first one there. Exactly. He was the first one there. He rocked me. He was, every time I woke up, every time I came to, Father Powell was there with me. And see, I knew he loved me. And he, it's a difference when people just want to have control of you and not care. Mm -hmm. and, and all about the West End, it's all about caring for somebody exactly. else, you know? We, we, we lost that when we lost yeah. the West End. Tell us about your brother, Pineapple. Hmm? Everybody knew Pineapple. <laughs> well, Wesley was, he, he was a character in itself. You know, he, he had walled wall friends, but he was a troublemaker when he was a kid. And he'd start fights and he'd say, my mother said, don't let, ever let nothing <coughs> happen to your brother. And so many a kid, we had a crack with people's foot trying to come through that door because Wesley would start trouble and they would run him to, <laughs> and he'd say, come on outside, you got to fight for me. What? Yeah, Ma, I'm telling Ma, if you don't come outside and fight for me, I'm going to tell Ma. And uh, many a day I'd have to go outside and I'd say, please, God, I, said, I don't want to fight. How do you fight a kid that ain't did nothing to you? And when he got to be a fight, he was like, he started boxing, he was like 14. He won the Golden Gloves Championship in Lowell. And see, when he was 14, he told people he was 16. When he was 16, he told people he was 18. When he was 16, he turned professional. And professional I, fighter. He was, he was known all over the place. And right? I signed my mother's name. <laughs> and so when he turned 18, he was really professional. My mother said, well, how did he get all this without me? So I said, Ma, you don't remember signing them papers when I brought it in? She says, no, I don't remember him signing those papers when he brought it in. So she says, how was, so when she looked in the TV and she seen he was fighting, my mother knew he was, never knew he was fighting until she saw him on TV fighting Sugar Hot, you know? And then she said, how did he get up there? And then we had to tell my mother, you know, that uh, I had signed these papers, but he was actually 16 years old. When he died, they had different names. Junior, my brother Junior's name is William, and he fought on the, he fought on a, uh, Junior's name, mm -hmm. and, and Junior fought. Uh, on the Williams name. name. Yeah, so this, it says Willie Pineapple Stevenson, mm -hmm. and that was never his name because his name is Wesley. Wesley. You know, and um, he never, he was an unorthodox fighter. He never trained. He was a gym fighter. He'd stand there and you don't let a lady show up. Oh, he, oh, he had tats that she wouldn't believe. And he, that was that was that was that was a good part about the West End. It, everybody knew Pineapple. Yeah. He was famous and all that. And you, know, you had a big big family. Everybody knew them. Would well, you? we're coming to the end of the show now, and uh, I enjoyed having you. This was a great, great, wonderful, wonderful show, and you brought a lot of insight into what was living in the West End and what it is today living in, in this world. And we all miss that. So thank you for being my guest. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. And see you at the next West End video newsletter.
covered now with lines and creases, tickets torn. 